Hello everyone, back to our review of poetic tools and devices. Today we're talking about metaphors. I'm so happy to be doing this because I just finished shoveling snow. It's February uh, for nearly 90 minutes. I'm exhausted and I'd much rather be talking about metaphors and not literally be shoveling snow. I'm sorry, that was a bad joke. All right, so you know what metaphors are. You talk about metaphors with you, with your teachers for the last uh, couple of years. Not a, you understand that. Uh, so we're going to go over how a little bit more deeply how in, just in two poems, poets use metaphors. All right, uh, here's a definition. I'm going to read it in my best uh, reading a definition from a textbook voice. A metaphor is in is non literal language. In poetry, however. It is more and less than that. Poets generally mix literal and non-literal language in their poems. That's what confuses students about poems. That's what confuses novice students when they're writing about poems and they're reading poems. When is the poet being literal and when is the poet being metaphoric? It's tough sometimes. Poets rely on the listener's understanding of what is being referenced by the highly focused form of non-literal expressions. That, look at that last sentence. The poets rely on the, read, on the listener's knowledge, on the reader's knowledge about what they're referencing. If they're, create, if they're using a, a metaphor and the reader doesn't know what the reference is to, that poem fails. And that's why, uh, you know, the second poem I'll be explaining a bit more. Uh, some older poems that are still in textbooks because, you know, they're good, they're legitimate, they explore really deep ideas in really original ways, but the metaphors are a little old. And that's why when you read Shakespeare, there's so many footnotes because a lot of the references are, we don't get anymore. All right, so here's, here's a metaphor. The students plow through the summer reading list. Common metaphor, farming metaphor. You use a plow to cut through the hard soil. So you extend that metaphor to anything that's hard, like summer reading. So the summer, the students plow through the summer reading. Nice, simple explanation, right? Uh, we're going to look at this poem here. First poem I want you to write about. There's three questions for each. The same three questions. We'll go over, we'll go over how to answer them. Uh, first here is the sick rose by William Blake. Uh, he was a poet and artist uh, in the 1700s. He's an early Romantic era poet. We'll be looking at more of his poems uh, later on in the semester in the, next, in the coming weeks. But this one here, The Sick Rose. Uh, you see here that he drew and he painted around his poems. He, was, he wrote two famous books of poems, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience, that he did this with, and it, it's just amazing, the, the artwork. Uh, okay, so The Sick Rose by William Blake. Let's just get right to it. O Rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love doth thy life destroy. I'm going to let you all figure this out out a bit for yourself. Um, we're going to go over the questions here, just so you know what is the main metaphor. Poets use um, this, uh, this structure of main or driving metaphors. So they'll have one metaphor that, that kind of holds the whole poem together. And then they'll kind of, no matter how long or how short, when you look back at the poem, The Rose, no matter how long or how short, they'll kind of change that metaphor around. And that's where they create their message. Uh, how does the listener, listener understand this metaphor? For this question, I want to see, I want you to explore how, how the main metaphor changes as you read the poem. And give the poem meaning in a few sentences, three, no more than three sentences for this answer to, you know, don't go overboard on this. Uh, this poem, I'm going to tell you, you're going to get it wrong. Everybody gets it wrong. When I took intro to po poetry in college, I got it wrong. Everybody gets it wrong, and that's why I have this here, because you kind of, you learn from your mistakes. And making mistakes in math is the same as making mistakes when you're reading poetry. 
you don't make those mistakes again. You, you kind of you learn to look for different details. Second poem uh, is by John Donne. He's uh, one of the greatest metaphysical poets. Uh, it's a, as I say here, he reckons that metaphysical poets re reconcile the physical and spiritual world. Uh, so, you know, he wrote about the soul. He wrote about God. He wrote two different poems, two different types of poems, religious or secular. This is one of his secular poems. I'm going to give a little bit of explanation here, and we'll look at some of the lines a little closely. I'd be doing this. We'll do this when we get in class, too, because this is a metaphor that you might not, because it's old, it's an old poem, uh, you might not be as familiar with. The flea. I, you all know what fleas are. Uh, I think he was writing in an era where if you were rich, you didn't have as many fleas on you as poor people did. Everybody had fleas. Uh, so in this poem, he's kind of using the flea to make an argument to a woman to sleep with him before getting married. And he's using the flea as the basis of this argument. You'll see. I I'm not going to read every single line. You do that, and then you answer the questions. He's being funny here. Mark but this flea, and mark in this, how little that which thou deniest me is. It sucked on me first, and now sucks on thee, and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. What's the big deal? You can sleep with me, I can sleep with you. This flea has already done the deed for us, because our blood is mingled. Isn't that what it's all about, the mingling of blood? Uh, and he says here, nor sin, nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead. Uh, maidenhead is a metaphoric term for virginity. Hey, there's a reference to that. I only bring that up because there's a reference to that later on. It's not a good, it's a funny argument. It's not a good argument. Though. And then I'm going to go right to the last stanza. There's only three stanzas in this poem, so it's not really long. Cruel and sudden hast thou since purpled thy nail in the blood of in innocence? Wherein could this flea guilty be? except in that drop, which it sucked from thee. That's the woman's answer to his argument, to his trying to seduce by crushing the flea and therefore crushing his argument. And there again, you know, purple, uh, purple thy nail in the blood of innocence, another, re another metaphorical reference to uh, virginity, uh, of which this woman is having none of this argument. Uh, deservedly so. So again, main metaphor, right? Just like you do with 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 essays, and just like you do with novels, just like you do with stories, you can use the title to try to identify a main metaphor. How does the listener understand? How does this main meta? How does this meta? You understand this poem through the changes that the main metaphor undergoes, and in a few sentences, give that meaning. Okay, not a lot of work. As I said, this is mostly review. Uh, if you have questions, email me those or bring them to class. I uh, have fun with these, especially that's the second poem. It's it's quite lighthearted and glib.